Welcome to the Town Hall Get to Know broadcast. We certainly appreciate the fact you're going to take time. Come and join us this evening. We're talking all about food tonight. Well, we're talking about diet, but we're going to talk about it with a little bit different aspect this evening. We're talking to Dr. Nina Saville Rockland. She is a psychoanalyst and an author and a radio host specializing in uh, eating disorders. Uh, she has an emphasis on binge eating. So we're going to be talking about food. It's going to be a great show. If you happen to be watching on Facebook or in uh, YouTube at a later point, feel free to make uh, comments. Those uh, people that are watching live, uh, this is an interactive broadcast as well. We want to thank all the people that are taking time to watch us on E360 TV on your smart TV. You can download that application and watch us on Roku, uh, Amazon Fire, Apple and Android TV. So check us out. We're under positive vibrations. We'd love to have you watch there. And uh, we are so uh, glad to be here today. Uh, we've got a very special guest, uh, Dr. Nina. And uh, I was uh, recommended to have her on the show, and I'm very excited about this. And uh, truly, without uh, further ado, in just a moment here, we'll be back with her. Stick around. It's going to be a great show. Let's hear a word from our sponsors. If you happen to be in Sarasota or Manatee counties, make sure you go check out Sarasota Architectural Salvage. They have some great stuff, I tell you. Up on University, they've got a brand new store. And, of course, downtown, check them out. Make sure that you tell them that you saw this video or commercial, excuse me, here. Okay? Tell them that we sent you, the LWN Town Hall. All righty. So without further ado, let's bring in our guest, Dr. Nina. Hello. Well, good evening, Dr. Nina. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm so happy to be here with you. Excellent. Well, I know that you've got a very busy schedule, so we're very honored that you're with us this evening. You're a very busy person. And uh, I'm just really glad that we're here. We're talking about food. We're talking about diet. Um, I kind of want to take it a little bit further because diet really has a lot to do with our well-being. And so we'll be talking about our well-being tonight. But uh, why don't you just uh, maybe uh, share with the viewers uh, a little bit about yourself so that they can get to know you as well. Well, before I talk about what I do, I think it would be really helpful for me to tell my story of how I came to do the work that I do. Um, so when I was five years old, it goes back to when I was five years old, and I suddenly and seemingly randomly looked down at my thighs and thought, my thighs are too big and I need to lose weight. Now, my parents were hippie college professors that didn't believe in TV. I didn't re see any kind of media, no magazines, no TV, no nothing that would make me compare my body, even at age five, to something I was seeing in the media. But this began my descent into what I consider eating disorder hell. And by the time I was a teenager, uh, every journal of, of that time, every page of every journal is filled with numbers. I wrote down what I ate, what I didn't eat, how many calories I burned, how many calories I ate. You know, I would go to sleep thinking, okay, am I going to gain weight tomorrow morning or lose it? And I was just completely preoccupied 24 seven by my weight. And I would go in a, like a cycle of restricting and then binging and then binging and purging and then restricting. And so this cycle continued and it was horrible. And finally in college, I went to therapy, but I went for anxiety. I did not tell my therapist that I was struggling with food, weight, body image. I, she had no idea that I was the poster child for eating disorders, which is what I considered myself to be. Wow. And so in therapy, and here's the, here's the cool part. Yeah. So I talked about, um, you know, guy stuff and future stuff and parent stuff and friend stuff and all kinds of stuff. Uh, my relationship to myself, all of that. I talked about everything but food. And at, 
after I left therapy, all my eating disorder behaviors were gone for good. And people say, what? How is that possible? How do you get rid of eating disorders, three eating disorders, without ever talking about food? And the thing is, food was never the problem. Food was a solution to the problem. The real problem was my perfectionistic tendencies, my toxic relationship to myself, my slave driving, all of this stuff. This was the problem. So why? Why? Let me go back to why did I decide at age five that, the, that, that my thighs were too big? Well, as I said, my parents were college professors and they were very academic and very serious. And I was five. I was a kid. I was, you know, bouncing all over the place. And I was constantly being told, calm down. You're too loud. You're too dramatic. You just you need to tone it down. And in my five year old mind, I took that as you're too much. And that too muchness then got translated, generalized to my body. And I think that the idea was if there was less of me, somehow I would be more lovable. And so this taught me the power of the mind when it comes to eating issues. And you know, people say they have no willpower, or no control or whatever. No, something is going on inside you and, and you're using food for a reason. And once you realize what that reason is, because sometimes it's hidden from you, mm -hmm. um, once you get to those hidden reasons and work through them, then like me, you are really liberated for good. And that is my passion to help people do as a psychoanalyst and on my show and in my books. That's, that's wow, that's a, quite a story. Now, uh, I think that you've hit uh, the nail on the head when you talk about the fact that food, that wasn't the problem, that was a symptom, right? And that there's more to it than that because I think that with a, a, just about any addiction, what we're talking about here is there's something else going on. And so that's how we're kind of medicating ourselves, right? Exactly. And I would even say that the addiction, if we're even going to use that term, is yeah. not to food. It is not to the substance of food. People tell me all the time, oh, I'm addicted to sugar. It's not to food. It, it's an addiction to eating to resolve something. And I'll, yeah. if I may give a really good example of that, yes. um, I had a patient who I called Jenna, not her real name. I call her Jenna. And she came in one day and she said, you know, Dr. Nina, maybe your other patients, they have emotional problems or they, they're dealing with something that's going on inside or they're upset about something. She said that she did not have, she was not an emotional eater, that she was a food addict. She was addicted to ice cream and that she could prove it. So I said, hmm, okay, prove it. I'm all ears. Um, and she told me that the night before she had been watching TV. Nothing was bothering her. She had a good day at work. She was Netflix and chilling. And all of a sudden, as she put it, ice cream was calling her name. Ben and Jerry's was calling her name. She said, Dr. Nina, I'm addicted to Chunky Monkey. <laughs> Nothing is going on. So I said, well, not so fast. What were you watching on TV? And she tells me it's her favorite show, Charmed. It's her guilty pleasure. She was having a great time watching her favorite show. And, and, and therefore, she's just addicted to Chunky Monkey. What was the episode about, I ask? She tells me, it's the devil comes down, the sisters start fighting, everything gets really nasty and contentious. And then she went, oh, because at that moment, she realized that watching the show had activated her own issues with her own sister. And before she could even become consciously aware that she was triggered, she went to ice cream for distraction and comfort. And if we had been sitting around saying, well, the next time ice cream calls your name, brush your teeth or take the dog on a walk or take a shower, nothing would have happened because it was not the problem. It was the solution to the problem. When we dealt with her, complicated, complex, difficult relationship with her sister, and I taught her how to identify and process those feelings, guess what? Ice cream stopped calling her name. And that's an example of how it really is not about what people think it's about. 
something else is going on inside. Well, that's a, that's a great point. Something else is going on inside. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm not using the right words, but these are the words that I was taught. And, and as I, every day is an opportunity to learn and grow. And that's why I love this show is because I, I have people like yourself that I get to learn from and grow. But I was going to say coping, yes. you know, coping mechanism, yes. um, you know, a way to deal with things that are going on. And then, you know, uh, well, let me ask this question. Do you think that there is a, is it a mental thing or maybe a physical thing? Or is it just straight a mental issue of coping mechanisms and it might not be a healthy mechanism to use? That is a great question because especially in the world of eating disorders, there's been this, this tendency to go towards the brain and call it a brain-based illness. And I object to that. I think it is absolutely a coping mechanism. I don't even like the, 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 the term mental illness. I think it is just a very mm -hmm. deleterious coping strategy. It is, a, it is a frenemy. It does something for you, but it also hurts you. And it's not located in your brain. It is located in your mind. And we, we can change the way we think. We can change the way we relate to ourselves in the world. And that, of course, d does have changes in our brains. But it, we're, we're not just victims of our brains. We have minds, and our minds are powerful. And we tap into the power of our minds, conscious or unconsciously. Yeah. Um, amazing things can happen. I, and I like, to, I like to make the analogy with an, a weed and a root. So if you, just, if you just pluck a weed, it is going to grow back because the problem is not the weed, it's the root that's causing the, the weed to grow. So if you just go on a diet and go on a diet and go on a diet, it's just plucking weeds and thinking that you're gonna lose weight and keep it off and it's all gonna be fine. You've gotta to get to the root, which I love the analogy because you can't see a root just like you can't discern your unconscious mind, it's hidden from you, but it creates these behaviors. And then once you do that, everything changes. Then you, then you know what you're fighting. You can't fight an invisible army, but when you make it visible, then you can fight back, then you can win. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I know that you, you kind of work it from a different perspective versus a lot of other doctors. And it, it's not what we're eating as much as what's eating at us is in your own words, right? Yes, it's not what you're eating that is truly the problem, it is why. And if you just focus on what you're eating, which diets do, they, diets also are about deprivation. And the anticipation of deprivation or the experience of deprivation will always make you want something more. If I tell you, you cannot eat pizza, until you lose X many pounds, what are you gonna want? Pizza, whether you actually want pizza or not. It's that deprivation that's gonna make you want more of it. What do you think that it is that, that and I know that I was guilty uh, heavily of being told, don't do this or you shouldn't do that, and yet I would just do it. I mean, what's going on with that? Well, it, de it depends on the person, but if I were to make a general, generalization, I'd say that we want to feel like we're in control of our lives. We want to feel a sense of efficacy and control. And when someone says, don't do that, our automatic response is they're taking our power away from us is to get that power back by doing it. It's all about control, right? It's about feeling empowered. Yeah. Empowered. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when we're empowered, we, we, we feel that we have the strength and maybe the ability to control our outcomes, which in fact, I know that we, we do. And, I, and I'm a big believer, and I'm sure that that's as well why we connected too. Uh, of course, we, yeah, Kelly Gunter, who was on the show last week, had mentioned that I should talk to you. I think that you do a show or does she do the show with you sometimes we or how does that work? We have an amazing program called the Binge Free Babes yes. program, and it is a monthly membership program where we help women um, get to those roots that I was just talking about. And it's a process of 
some reading material. We use both one of my books and Kelly's book and these action plans because it's not enough to just do uh, like food for thought. It's not enough to just think about it. I think people really need some action and then they need community, which is why we decided to create this community to help people. And we have people literally all over the world, which is really cool and helping them get to understand that it's not that they have no willpower. It's not that they have no control. There's, it's not that there's something wrong with them. It's that they're relating to themselves in a, in a, in a way that is, causing them to turn to food for some reason, whether it is distraction or comfort, or sometimes people eat until they're in physical pain, converting their emotional pain to physical pain, things like that, things that no one is talking about out there, but must be understood. And now we're seeing incredible changes. So as these women get, get more interested in themselves and why they're doing what they're doing, they change. You have to want to, though, don't you? You have to want to more than you more than you don't. There's always um, like a fear, and and I I mm -hmm. actually find that one of the things that people struggle with the most is a fear of being too happy. And that might sound just ludicrous. Like, like what do you mean? Of course, I want to be happy. I, I live to be happy. I'll be happy when I lose twenty pounds. Uh, but but when it comes down to it, there are some negative ideas about happiness. Like if you step on that rug of happiness, is it gonna get swept out from underneath you? And so one way of never being too happy is to always be worried about your weight or you know, other people think it's somehow noble to suffer. So don't be happy, you're supposed to suffer. Or they come from families where life is hard and if, if, if everyone in the family is like, oh, life is hard and you are, life is good, do you feel connected to your family? So there are so many uh, reasons why people do what they do or why they sabotage their weight loss efforts or, you know, what have you. It's, it's just, I call myself a detective of the mind because I want to solve the mystery of if you're doing something you don't want to do, or you're not doing something you want to do, there is a reason. There is a reason. I, I, I like the fact that you mentioned that word hard. I think it's tossed around way too freely, to be honest. Uh, I know that a lot of times when I talk about uh, trying to motivate people, it's, a, it's about uh, taking action uh, on our thoughts because it takes more than like you said just a thought it takes us to do something about it as well and it was always like hard work you know you got to work hard to get this to happen uh, and I just it's like this isn't good for me for some reason so it's like no it takes a lot of work <laughs> not hard work <laughs> yes just that little semantic change ha has such a profound effect but some people feel like they're supposed to be struggling and suffering and it's got to be hard. And then when it's not, they're waiting for the, the, the hard thing to come back or the difficult situation to return. And, 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 it, and it's scary. It's scary to be too happy. And, and, and part of this, I think, is maybe coming from these preconceived notions uh, that we learned as behaviors as a child that became our belief system that oh yeah it should be hard because that's what we were told that it would be hard or difficult or you'll never be able to do that you know and so we decided to own that which wasn't in the end true and so that's what you do is you help people overcome that negative thinking and so words and the words that we use are really important factors words are so powerful and one thing that I see with a lot of people is the way they talk to themselves, both the words that they use and the tone that they use it. For example, uh, someone said to me recently that she had she had decided that she would have like a whatever she wanted for for lunch. And then she so she said, oh, I I thought I, I'm just going to have whatever I want for lunch instead of eating rabbit food. And um, but then I ate too much of it and I felt really bad. And I told myself, See, you have no willpower, you have no control, you are 
you're disgusting, you're gross, and no one's ever going to love you. So notice how she went from the pronoun I, I'm going to have what I want for lunch, to this pronoun, the, the you, the second person voice that was talking to her in the meanest of possible ways. And I asked people, hey, what if you were to say I, I suck, I am gross, and they can't do it but they can do it when they say you, when they talk to themselves in the second person. And so even making the change of don't talk to yourself in second person, don't you on yourself, always come from an I place and you'll be surprised at mm -hmm. how, you know, the, the, the way that you use language to yourself, how that makes you feel. Because people are mean to themselves, they feel bad. And then when they feel bad, they use food to cope. When you're nice to yourself, you don't feel bad. You don't need food to cope. Right, right. And, you know, to a great degree, there's nothing wrong with food because we need food. It's a matter of what we're eating, isn't it? And I believe in eating everything in moderation. The second you go on a diet, and again, I love what Taryn Brumfit in the documentary Embrace said. She said, never trust a four-letter word where the first three letters spelled die. <laughs> um, right. When you go on a diet, you 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 focus on what something is telling you what to eat, as opposed to tuning in to yourself. And I don't talk to people about food. I'm not a dietitian. I deal with the psychology of eating. But people inevitably, the less we talk about food, the and the more that they they have a choice, the more they feel empowered. They can eat something or not eat it. The less they they want the thing that they think they shouldn't have, or they'll have it and they'll say, gosh, you know what? I remember this as tasting so much better than it actually is. When it was the forbidden fruit or the forbidden mm -hmm. cake or the forbidden pizza or the forbidden whatever, right? they're just like stuffing it down and, and, and feeling terrible and eating more, and which doesn't make sense, but that's because it's psychological, not logical. Right. But when, right. when they have permission, eat it. Then they can decide how much to eat it, whether they want it. And a lot of times they'll say, you know, it's really not as good as I thought, or I'm good with just this one piece or something like that. Right. And and so that's the important factor in that it, it's the right word, moderation. And and from what I've learned is, is that, you know, it's okay to eat, like you just said, just about anything that you want. Just make sure that you're then not overdoing it you know excess is clearly uh, a potential problem but to you know, get to get to moderation ahead. to get to moderation though you've got to look at well what are you using food for because if if food is helping you cope if it is filling a void or numbing you or comforting you or soothing you or whatever and you don't have another way to do those things then it's pretty hard to eat moderately. So once you learn how to cope and to respond to yourself in a different way, then it does become a lot easier and almost natural to mm -hmm. eat more moderately. Mm -hmm. I found that when I went on that bad word, that diet, I was on um, HCG diet is what I did. You're familiar with HCG? H H CG diets. That when you got, did you get injections or? Yes, I was doing yeah. the injections. Yes, yes, and uh, and and it worked uh, because my just my uh, routine of not eating till late, I think, and then pretty much falling asleep, you know, right after I eat, and just sitting there wasn't just putting on weight. It just wasn't good. So I did the HCG, which was to melt off the fat, which which worked pretty well. But what I found when I did that better than, you know, yeah, that was fairly rash, I think, particularly for somebody that doesn't like needles, right, um, to have to inject myself every day. But the thing is, is that I started eating healthier as a result of that. And so by eating uh, healthier foods and and uh, taking bro probiotics because I wanted to talk about that, that, that this link between eating properly and this gut health, uh, that there's so much science coming out about the gut health and how that uh, affects our mind and uh, how that uh, our diet really does affect how we feel and, and, 
and our wellness uh, from a mental aspect. Would that be correct? Do you, would you agree with that? I think it will affect your brain. It will affect your autoimmune system. It will affect how you feel. But when you're using food to cope, it, 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 it sort of overrides all of that. So that it, again, we're in the difference between the, the, the mind and the brain. So if there's a, yeah. there's a psychological reason for binging. And by the way, I should make, I should, I should make sure that there's a difference between eating the wrong foods or eating or overeating even and binging or having a, a, or emotionally eating. Emotional eating is when you're eating something to resolve the way you feel emotionally. When you think, oh, if I eat that, I'm going to feel better. If I eat that, I'm not going to feel anything. Um, as opposed to, oh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I ate too much dinner or I'm eating too heavy of, of a foods and I need to cut back. So it's, it's, it's really motivated by something internal and it feels very compulsive. Right. Well, and that's, and why, I'm sorry, that's why the eating, eating addiction is a, as opposed to food addiction. So food addiction yeah. is, oh, people think they're actually addicted to sugar, for example. Right. Eating addiction is they're addicted to eating whatever to resolve something emotionally, sugar or right. no sugar. Right, right. So what was the epiphany for you that you, uh, as a child that you could be very conscious of uh, yourself, the body weight, uh, or the way that you look, uh, and then you decided, hey, I'm going to do something about this. This was painful for me. You say you've got counseling, um, what, at, at like maybe 19 or something like that, correct? And I then really, yeah, you decided I, to start helping people with this. Yeah. What, what, what was it that clicked and said, I got to stop this and we're going to go about helping people and helping myself as well? Because my anxiety was just out of control. And I actually was not even aware that my anxiety and what was going on with food were related. Um, so it was, I, I, it was unbearable to live the way that I was living. And by changing the way that I responded to myself, by being kinder to myself, by, being, by treating myself as I would treat a friend, like, you know, there's a, a saying, if you if you speak to your friends the way you speak to your body, you'd have no friends left. <laughs> that was me. I was really mean to my body and myself. And as I as I learned to be kinder to myself, my eating disorders just went away naturally. And mm -hmm. this was so profound that I really wanted to take what I had learned and, and help other people achieve the same and help other people say, look, it's not what you think it is. And there is a way out. And then the other thing I hear all the time and that I thought myself was, was, oh, I'm going to have to struggle with this the rest of my life. No, no, you learned how to do this. You learn this way of relating to yourself and therefore to food. You can unlearn it and you can learn a different way. And I feel very passionate about helping people see, you know, see the light really mm -hmm. that, that it, it, it's not that you have no willpower. It's not about willpower. It's not about control. It, it's, it's not about anything that you think it is. It's about something else. And when you can really look at that something else with curiosity instead of criticism, your world will change. Mine did. My patients do. People in my programs do. People in the Binge Free Babes, the program I have with Kelly, they, mm -hmm. they see, they're seeing it. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable about how once you change your mindset, so many aspects of your life will change, including your relationship with food, which then changes your weight. Excellent. That's, 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 I, I love this because this, it, it does break back to thinking and, and, and it's so powerful. I'd like to go ahead. We're going to take a quick break uh, for one of our sponsors. Uh, we want you to stick with us. We'll be right back. We're going to be talking about uh, the fact that Dr. Nina is a, a psychoanalyst 
and the fact that she has written uh, a book, uh, The Binge Cure, Seven Steps to Outsmart Emotional Eating uh, and Food for Thought. She's a couple books, right, actually? Three books, as I recall. And, yeah, and then a third one that I co-edited with my mentor called Beyond the Primal Addiction. <laughs> Beyond the Primal Addiction. So join us and stay with us. Don't change the channel. We'll be right back. So you're watching the town hall get to know. We have Dr. Nina Seville Rockland with us this evening. We're talking about food. We're talking about uh, diets, not the conventional type of diet. We're talking about thinking. We're talking about how to make a difference in our life and deal with the, the reasons that create us to or create the opportunity for us to use food as a coping mechanism. Now, Dr. Uh, Nina has uh, written several books uh, and the author of The Binge Cure, Seven Steps to Outsmart Emotional Eating, uh, Food for Thought, Perspective on Eating Disorders, and a co-editor of Beyond the Primal Addiction. You know, she is featured in Psychology Today, Good Housekeeping, The Los Angeles Times, uh, Red Book, Huffington Post, Beverly Hills Times, and many other national uh, publications. You're a frequent guest on Dr. Drew. Boy, I tell you, you're making a major impact in uh, the community with respect to this. I'm doing my best. Although I should say I've only been on Dr. Drew once. I'm a frequent okay, well. guest expert, but just once with Dr. Drew, which was an amazing experience. But yes, I, I, I really, I, I think it is so important for people to understand that the, the what they think is the problem is not the problem. It is the solution to the problem. And it's also keeping them from feeling good about themselves, from being responsive to themselves, from being kind to themselves, from living their best lives. And I want people to, to wake up. I want them to think about their day, not their diet, and I want them to enjoy their lives. Well, and life was made to enjoy, isn't it? You know, um, but... I know like for myself, I, I didn't enjoy my life for a long time until I actually started being honest with myself. And you mentioned that earlier about that honesty of looking at the reasons why. Maybe you can explain to the viewers because I'll, I'll be truthful. I'm, I'm not that familiar with a psychoanalyst. How is that different from, say, uh, a psychologist? Well, psycho a psychoanalyst. Yeah, psychoanalysts are have the most training in the field of psychologist of any mental health professional. To be a psychoanalyst, you already have to be a licensed therapist, social worker, psychiatric nurse, doctor, or psychologist. Um, and the training involves, uh, part of it is studying, and part of it is um, doing analysis with people, and part of it is being in analysis four times a week for a period of years. So you, you, it's a real deep dive into the unconscious. And people hear psychoanalysts and they think Freud. Well, comparing me to Freud is like is like is like comparing a Model T car to a you know a, a Tesla. They're both cars, but right. that's about it. So even though psychoanalysis has its roots, of course, in in Freud, that is not at all how contemporary analysts are. And we really look, we use dreams, we use um, our, our, our methods to discern what is going on in the roots, the, the, uh, the hidden parts of us that may have bearing in your current trouble. It's, and that's why I say I'm a detective. And I'm, I'm looking at, well, why are you doing what you're doing that's out of your awareness, but not out of operation? So maybe you can differentiate the fact that uh, we have a conscious awareness and we have a subconscious awareness and how that subconscious plays a, a role in our conscious behavior. Yes. Our, so 
earlier when I told the story of, of Jenna, who was, you know, her unconscious made her go to ice cream because it, it was it was unconscious that she was stirred up because, and triggered with her, the sister stuff that stayed unconscious until until we were able to recognize what was going on. So unconscious is when there are hidden ideas, beliefs, feelings, hidden parts of you that you're not aware of, but they have so much to do with the conscious choices you make. Isn't the, the subconscious is the belief system, correct? The, uh, yeah, the, w well, it's a belief system. It's, it's so much more. It can be, un you could have unconscious emotions, but, but yes, the belief so system, some, feelings, um, conflicts, all kinds of things. So we can be dealing with behaviors uh, that might not be healthy for us, but not even really be aware of the reasons why. Is that what you're really getting? Exactly, exactly. We think we have no control. We think we have no willpower. It's not logical. It's psychological. People will tell me things like that. They, they get up, they get on the scale. The scale says they've gained three pounds. They feel terrible. And what's the first thing they do? They go to food. <laughs> and then they say, it doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Well, it's not logical. It's psychological. That's not really an unconscious motivation, but that is, right. okay, you don't have the wherewithal to respond to yourself. You're going to be mean to yourself. You don't know how to be kind, to be nurturing, to, to be supportive of yourself. So you're going to food which takes you away from yourself, which abandons you, which comforts you, whatever. Um, but so how would a person then adopt uh, a healthier attitude so that they didn't feel like they, uh, well, not even feeling like they had to, or how do you then implement a plan so that you aren't going to do food in excess right well first and i should say that one of the reasons i wrote the book and i wrote my food mood formula in the book is because i want to help people access their hidden unconscious motivations um but to answer your question first you got to see what you're fighting first you got to realize that for example you're being mean to yourself and people will say, well, no, I'm just motivating myself. And I said, really? Is that how you motivate other people? By saying horrible things to them? <laughs> no, you're only motivating yourself that way. First, you got to realize, oh, you're actually doing something mean. You're being mean and cruel to yourself. You're not motivating yourself. How do you motivate other people? So they'll say, oh, I, I encourage them. I, val I validate them. I tell them, hey, you can do that. And I'll say, well, where's that for you? Where's that voice for you? So, so even recognizing that they're being mean is the first step to making a change. That's why I suggest changing the you. Don't talk to yourself in second person. Who's talking, right? Right. Talk to yourself from an I place. Watch the tone. Why are we talking to ourselves in a you? Sometimes that's because we are talked, we, that's how we're spoken to. There's a woman named, named Carly Gass who calls my radio show a lot. And she, she demonstrates this so perfectly because she had these ants who were very mean to her. And every time she talks to herself, she talks in a totally different tone and it's the ants tone. So she'll say something like, um, yes, I was feeling this way and then I thought, See, you and she, she doesn't so mean, I can't even recreate it. It's so mean and toxic, but see, you're, you're, you're a failure. You're never going to get what you want. And it's in this, mm -hmm. this like ugh, nasty, evil, witchy type of tone. And okay. she's identified with the way she was treated. So mm -hmm. often we, people talk to us in a way that we, we hate it. And then we end up do, doing it to ourselves. And so, so that's one reason. And the other reason is some people don't get enough kind of, they get help of a holding environment growing up. It, things are too loosey goosey, you know, their, their parents are their friends and everything's cool and whatever. And they create 
this harsh voice to, to give themselves a sense of being have, having structure being held. Mm -hmm. So those are two of the reasons why people adopt this mean voice. I see. Um, and then, so that's a learned behavior. Now, what I'm curious about is, is some of the modalities that you use. Are, are you using things like uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or neuro-linguistic plan uh, programming to help people to, to be overcome their obstacles that they created for themselves? Well, psychoanalysis is in itself a, a treatment modality. And within psychoanalysis, there are many, many, many different modes and different different theories about the mind and about how to relate. So I use the relationship, I use dreams, I, I do use cognitive behavioral therapy, but I go deeper because I think it's crucially important to figure out where did those mistaken beliefs come from? It's not enough to just say, well, those are mistaken beliefs. To truly get rid of them, you've got to, you've got to unearth where did they come from? Where did you learn this from? Are there hidden wounds of the past that need to be healed? Are there ghosts from the past that are haunting your present? Um, and and we, we really look at that and have one foot in the past and one foot in the present, because it's not about looking at the past. I've had people say, oh, I was in therapy for 15 years and all we did was talk about the past. And I'll say, that is fine, but that doesn't help you. What you have to do is recognize how your experience of the past is affecting you now. For example, you had a judgmental, critical mom and you grew up and thought you put it all behind you. And, but, but somehow you're only dating judgmental, critical people. Mm -hmm. That is hoping that the new judgmental, critical person is gonna turn into a kind, loving, supportive, wonderful person. Only it never happens, you just repeat the whole horrible thing because judgmental people never become nice. So that's an example of how the past can affect your present and you really gotta put them together and not just be only in the present or only in the past, but see the interplay of both of them. So it sounds like it's fairly comprehensive uh, therapy that a person would need to go through. And, and I'm sure it can be painful to be looking back at some of the past stuff. And some of this stuff, it sounds like, as uh, you had mentioned, you're a detective. So you got to dig it up and figure out where was this coming from? But it's uh, not. Do you, do you feel that you're intuitive as well so that you're you're sensing something on 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 an energy level from them? I do. I, I, I do. I do feel at times that I, I, I'm so with them like because we're doing this work together and I, I'm tuned into them and I'm putting things together that I can be intuitive and I, I do feel intuitive. Um, I think part of that is just innately me and it helps me be really good at what I do. Part of it is learned. You know, and 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 also I, I I tell people we're you know we're a team so it's very painful when you are a child and you go through something painful or an adult or go through something painful and you're alone but when you have someone with you truly with you who's there to hear you and comfort you and be there and 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 give you what you never got perhaps before not shame you but listen to you. That's an incredibly powerful and healing experience. Listening is an important factor of being able to help somebody, isn't it? Not just telling them. Hearing them and not trying to make it better. Right. And not trying to make it better. That's a really good point. We're not trying. I know for a lot of years, I think I felt like what I had to do was fix the really rough relationships that I was in and I was staying in it because I thought maybe I could fix that person and make them better or make them happier. Or they wouldn't do that. You even kind of mentioned that earlier, you know, if the person's critical and judgmental. Uh, you might not just change that. <laughs> it just is going to be the same, but you're hold, you're holding on to this thread. Oh, it, it get better. Is that actually a projecting 
uh, and not dealing with our own problems when we're kind of doing that and we're focusing on somebody else's problems and thinking that we can fix them instead of really looking at ourselves? It can be, or it, it can be that there's unfinished business from the past and this is what you learn to do and this is how you learn to relate to people is to especially parentified children or children of alcoholics and you, you learn to take care of the parent instead of expecting that the parent will take care of you. Often, if we become critical and judgmental of ourselves and we meet someone critical and judgmental, it's like, oh, you know me so well. But when you're kind to yourself and you are nurturing and loving to yourself and someone is critical to you, you're gonna say, you know what? No, thank you, get out of my life. So it, changing our relationship to ourselves is, is everything. It, it, it creates a ripple effect of change throughout all of our relationships. Yes, that's, I'm learning a lot, thank you. You know, I really am. And I hope that the viewers are, are, are learning from this. Um, by the way, if you happen to be catching this on Facebook, we really need your help out there on Facebook. Uh, we need you to share this out, is what we need you to do. Tell the friends, tell your friends, tell, tell the groups, this is a great, or if you know somebody that, that can benefit from this show, there's really some great information in here. We're going to also be finding out about how you can reach out and a Dr. Nina can help you or someone that you know. And she's got a regular radio show on all the time. One of the things that I wanted to hit on too, because it's still, I'll admit, is a somewhat of a problem for me is eating late, uh, then falling asleep kind of thing because I'm just exhausted in my day. What's this thing about eating late um, and, and, and how can we deal with this? Why are we eating late and what should we be doing instead? Well, again, there's a difference between eating late and being unable to stay out of the kitchen at night. Sometimes people eat at late because they are wound up from the day and they're actually using food as a kind of a sedative to calm down. But from my experience, nighttime eating is a real problem because that is when you are alone with yourself. During the day, you're busy, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're working, you're look, looking after kids or you're doing whatever it is that you're doing and you're distracted. But at night, you are alone with yourself. And if you can't be alone with yourself because that's when you might have feelings or thoughts or ideas that are uncomfortable that you wanna push away, yeah. Who does that for you? And so, so thanks for that comment. You can see that comment up there, right? Fun fact, nobody likes late dessert like Steven. That's yeah, that's me. <laughs> but there's having dessert and there's there's like compulsively eating dessert. Yeah. So there there's a big difference. There's a there's a continuum. One is okay, you're gonna have dessert late, and the other is you're you're gonna you can't stop eating that dessert. Right, right. Can't say I've ever sat down and ate a whole gallon of ice cream or something like that. And I do love ice cream, but um, I learned the dessert thing from, you know, growing up. It was like my mom always had dessert, you know, and it was like after dinner there was dessert. And that was like a treat. So it's like that's a special thing. I always I guess that's where that's coming from for me. Well, then to not have dessert would be to maybe not feel cl like close to your mom in some level. Right. Mm. That, that when you when you. When you have dessert at night and mom had dessert at night, unconsciously, that could be a sense of a connection to your mom. Who knows? Who knows? It's about moderation, folks, remember? <coughs> Excuse me. Moderation is the important factor here. Now, I'd like to have you tell the viewers, you know, what if they felt that they might have an eating problem uh, and they were to uh, reach out to you? How, how would that benefit them and, and improve their life? Well, they can reach out to me. They can read my book. Uh, the Binge Cure is, is, the one, is the one that is for, this one is the one for mainstream viewer, readers. Um, and that would be a great place to start. I also offer uh, programs, and online therapy and although I'm, I'm booked, but I have openings in my programs. Binge Free Babes is an amazing community. They can also join my 
Facebook community, Dr. Nina's Food for Thought community, and you can connect with other people and you can connect, connect with me. I'm here to help, whether it is in my programs or in my book or call my radio show, you know, ask me a question. I really am so inspired to help people help themselves. So just reach out. I'm here. That's so beautiful. And, and, and I know that that's why we're connected as well. And, um, you know, everybody, this show is about uh, people like Dr. Nina, influential people who are making such a positive impact in, in the community and society as a whole. With technology, we can. We can reach around the world now. It's so beautiful. And, uh, well, of course, with COVID, you know, it uh, takes care of that through uh, Zoom is a fantastic thing, you know? It's a beautiful thing. So yes, we would love for you to reach out if you or you know someone that could uh, benefit and, and sounds like Dr. Nina, um, boy, super smart, clearly able to help people through maybe traumas that they've experienced in, in their past to be able to come to a point where they can enjoy their everyday life. and. For me, that's what it's about, to try to help people to enjoy their everyday life. We've got a couple minutes here left, uh, Dr. Nina. Uh, what closing thoughts and advice would you give the viewers? I really think that the most important thing to remember is there is hope. I, I have people in my practice, and by the way, I see men and women uh, from 30s, 20s, 30s through 70s. And the majority of my people have, are in their like 40s, 50s, 60s, and they've struggled for decades. And no matter how long you've been struggling, it is never too late to change. That you learned this way of relating to yourself and you can learn a new way. So I just, I just, wanna, I just wanna say that again, as long as you have a beating heart and, the, and a willingness to look, look inward, there is hope. There is hope. There's light in the darkness. Uh, it takes action, though, doesn't it, Dr. Nina? Yeah. Doing And doing nothing is an action, too. It is doing hard. Nothing, yeah. yeah. Doing nothing is doing something, isn't it? It's just not resolving anything for people. And and that there is, there is a way to move past this. I don't like to talk about recovery. I like to talk mm -hmm. about liberation. Recovery is you're like in recovery and it feels like it's forever. You're going to be in recovery. I'm talking about liberation. You see the invisible army, you make it visible, you beat it, and then you're free. You win the diet war. You're free. And that's what I want that. for other people. That's and it's a, possible. That is great. Remember, folks, we were talking about the words that we use and the power that they have. Liberation is definitely a great word. I love that. Because I'd always struggled with uh, the word recovery, or I'm in recovery. And, yeah, it's a lifetime, you know, I'm addicted for life. I got to watch myself every day. And it's like, you know, and it just brings on the potential if you're to slip that, you know, you're going to just beat yourself up over that. And it's you know what? I, I know that we, we all have greatness within us and we're all special in our own way. And so it's a matter of just finding that specialness. Uh, Dr. Nina, I think that what you've done is, is an example of from uh, a painful situation uh, and that you experienced when you were young, you were able to draw your strength from that and then share that strength and share that life to be able to help empower others. Thank you. Sorry, your voice just went out, but I, oh, oh there, you're back. Okay. Maybe Thank, I was too far off of the mic. It, it was, it was absolutely a, a joy to be here and to share my thoughts with your audience. And it yeah. was a, a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And we want to shout out Kelly Gunter. Kelly Gunter introduced us. Thank you so very much. They've got a great show, The Binge Babes. They checked that out on Facebook, right? Uh, the binge, bingefreebabes.com. It is a monthly membership program. And as part of it, we have an amazing Facebook group, great community, and meetings with me and Kelly on Zoom 
once a week. And it's just, it's just so, it's just so incredible to see the changes that are going on. And I'm so glad to be doing it with Kelly Gunter, one of my favorite people. She's so awesome. And if you didn't see it, folks, she was on our show last week on Monday. Do check it out. You can check it out on e360tv.com. You can also check it out on uh, our website, the lwnfoundation.org. And it's not the, it's lwnfoundation.org. Uh, check us out. Uh, the videos are there. We appreciate you. We're very blessed and honored. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight, Dr. Nina. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Hey, folks, we'll be back on uh, Wednesday. We're going to have uh, we're going to have Dr. Um, now I'm doing a brain fade here. <laughs> Dr. Jenny Wilkins, you uh, may have seen her before. Well, we had the Ask Dr. Jenny show last year. She's been busy doing a whole bunch of other stuff. And so we're going to have her back on Wednesday. Please join us for that. In the meantime, stay blessed, stay happy. And know that there is light, just like Dr. Nina said. We'll see you on Wednesday. Take care, everybody. Bye now. We let our bathtub go too long. It had rust in it. It had deep pitting in it. There were chips. I, quite frankly, thought it was unrepairable. Total Coatings is a family-owned and operated bathtub and shower refinishing company. We've been around since 2006, but we use a exclusive non-toxic porcelain coating that was developed over 60 years ago by a franchise in California. So the product is very well established. We refinish bathtubs, showers, wall tile, uh, countertops, and even sinks. Customers want to know what makes our product different, and that's, of course, the exclusive non-toxic porcelain. We also don't acid etch the surface, so you don't have to leave your home because of noxious fumes. I was completely and utterly shocked. It looked like a brand new bathtub. I would recommend total coatings to anybody.